Hey there, tech stylists. This lecture supports your learning about plain language during Module 3 of TECM 5190. First, I'm going to present some brief information about what's referred to as the plain language or plain English movement. Second, I'll define what people mean when they say plain language. And I'll end by explaining attempts to implement plain language, including a little about readability formulas. So let's start with a little context. The idea that the burden of understanding is on the writer is a relatively recent one in Western culture. I suppose it's been gaining traction very slowly over the centuries since democracy was born in ancient Greece. For most of Western history, the burden has been on the reader. For instance, did you know that the legal courts in Great Britain continued to use French up to 1731, despite the fact that English was returned to its official status as the language of the country in all other aspects of British life around 400 years earlier? Did you know that in Japan, most laws are still written in Chinese and have only begun to be translated into Japanese? These facts certainly reflect the attitude that the burden of understanding was or is on the reader. If you wanted to understand a legal trial in England in 1800, then you had to learn French or have an interpreter or a lawyer who understood it for you. Likewise, if you want to understand a Japanese law, you have to read Chinese. A great article by Adam Friedman from back in 2002 made me aware of these examples. Over the centuries, many have tried to place the burden on the writer. In the 16th century, King Edward VI in England asked that, I quote, the superfluous and tedious statutes be made more plain and short so that men might better understand them, unquote. In 1939 in the U.S., a Yale professor named Fred Rodell published a book proposing that every law be written so that its meaning is plain for all to see. The Plain Writing Act of 2010 finally made it the law that the U.S. government is required to communicate with us in plain language. Since then, the Center for Plain Language has been asking writing experts to evaluate how well federal agencies comply with the law each year. Here's their 2020 federal report card, which focused on coronavirus information. The Center provides an assessment of the pages they review, like this one from the Department of Commerce, where the judge noted several items that made their page an example of what not to do to achieve plain language. For example, the agency name appeared 15 times on the page, while the word you never appeared. One conclusion is the burden for comprehending the page is on the reader rather than the agency or writer, and that would be in violation of the law. Plain language efforts aren't confined to English, or to law, or government. One technical writing standard that I didn't mention in my Module 1 lecture is called STE, which stands for Simplified Technical English. Before the 1980s, everyone in the world had to read and understand English to maintain aircraft. STE was developed originally to improve readability of manuals for non-native English speakers. It also now aids in translation of those manuals. It has been time-consuming and expensive and has resulted in life-threatening mistakes. If all of this interests you, I've included links to many plain language sources in the To Learn More area for Module 3 on Canvas. Now that you've heard a little about the context within which the plain language or plain English movement developed, in Part 2, I'm going to define what plain language means. So I'm going to show you a pretty common definition from the Center for Plain Language. It's critical to note that plain language experts always define it by its results or outcome. Readers find what they need, understand it, and can use it. Annetta Cheek, who's chairman of the Center's board, worked for the U.S. government from 1980 until 2007. Most of her federal career focused on writing and implementing regulations. She spent four years as the chief plain language expert on Vice President Al Gore's National Partnership for Reinventing Government. In her 2008 testimony to the U.S. House of Representatives, she said, I quote, There are no hard rules except to be clear to your audience. End of quote. 
Nevertheless, the definition mentions three elements within a document, wording, structure, design. We won't be talking further about structure and design in TECM 5190, but of course we will be talking about wording. While defining plain language solely from an audience perspective makes the ultimate outcome or goal clear, it doesn't help anyone implement it. There are three other perspectives we can take to offer a fuller understanding of plain language. So the ultimate outcome is about the reader. The second option adopts the perspective of the writer or the organization they represent. Content owners can define plain language by noting that a communication is in plain language if its wording, structure, and design are so clear that it minimizes their expenses, let's say by reducing the number of support calls, and increases their benefits, for example, by making people more loyal to their brand. If there were no upside for the writer or their organization, no one would be willing to put in the effort to create messages in plain language. The third option adopts the perspective of the text. This is the one most people take because a simple checklist of wording, structure, and design features that a message should have would make life simpler for all content creators. You're learning about some linguistic style elements that often help readers most often. We'll continue to discuss these for the remainder of the course, but there is no simple checklist for every message. The fourth and final option adopts the perspective of the process for creating messages. Because the ultimate outcomes focus on the reader, the only way to ensure success is by adopting a process that includes message testing. You'll learn some testing options in this course a little later. I want to briefly summarize what Leslie Oflehaven teaches writers about text elements associated with plain language in her LinkedIn course. First, structure matters. In particular, it's vital to begin with the main point, what I call the bottom line message. Second, design matters. The use of visual elements like headings, bullets, tables, make messages more clear. Finally, wording matters. This is our sole focus in TECM 5190, so you'll practice creating plain language with only the wording you choose. Leslie provides a list of six guidelines that include addressing the reader with personal pronouns, using active voice, and implementing conciseness by limiting modifiers and smothered verbs. Here's the bottom line on defining plain language. Taking all four perspectives together provides us with a more accurate way of understanding what plain language is because just as in the parable of the blind men and the elephant, together they offer a more complete picture than any one perspective alone. In part three of the lecture, I want to explore some ways people have tried to implement plain language in organizations. I certainly won't do justice to all that could be said about the many ways people have tried to implement plain language over the centuries. Instead, I'm going to summarize them by mentioning uh, examples of four approaches. I've already mentioned one, the U.S. law, the Plain Writing Act of 2010. Several states have laws requiring consumer contracts to be written in plain language. I've also mentioned industry standards like simplified technical English officially known as ASD-STE-100, which was created to regulate how aircraft documentation was written. And in Module 1, you learned about guides like those at MailChimp, which require that their employees use plain language and messages to customers. Of course, laws, regulations, standards, and guides are a means of motivating writers to put the reader first. Most don't tell writers how to do that. Because plain language is not something taught in formal educational settings, except in some university-level technical or business writing courses, most writers need training in order to comply with laws or the guides of their organization. It's important to understand that training is both expensive and comes with no guarantees. I mean that there's no guarantee every employee will become willing and able to create plain language after a training session. That means that organizations have looked for more cost-effective tools. One of these cost-effective tools is a readability formula. 
I'm going to introduce you to readability metrics or formulas by showing you a site called Data Eyes, which my UNT colleague Dr. Ryan Bedker uses in his course on content analysis. This tool is the ultimate in cost effectiveness. It's free. I'm going to show you the results for two messages about coronavirus resources from U.S. government offices, both of which were judged by the Center for Plain Language in their annual Plain Language Report Card. First, we'll look at the readability results for the Department of Commerce site. I mentioned it a little earlier in the lecture. I've copied the text, pasted it into the Data Eyes site. Once the results run, they show passage stats like the number of sentences, words per sentence, characters per word, etc. And then below, we see six different readability scores. To make this more meaningful, let's compare these scores for a different page. We'll head to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau site, that's CFPB, and again, copy the text, pasted it into Data Eyes. The stats for the CFPB site show it's a little shorter at 49 rather than 68 sentences total. Words per sentence, just a little longer. I mean, basically the stats look very similar. Now, let's compare four of the readability scores. We'll look at Dale Chall first because research has identified it as the most accurate. The commerce material is assessed at well above college level. The CFPB is more readable, but also at a college level. Flesh Reading Ease assesses both at well below the level of plain language, but the CFPB site is more readable than the Commerce site. The Gunning Fog scores show that the two sites are both difficult, with the CFPB slightly less readable. Similarly, the Smog scores show that both sites require around 12 years of education. All in all, I think we can summarize these readability results as telling us that neither government message is in plain language, but the CFPB material is a little better. So would you like to know how the Center for Plain Language assessed these? They judged the commerce material is lacking, needs work, I mentioned that earlier. They judged the CFPB material as exemplary. I encourage you to visit the link to the Center's Federal Report Card located on Canvas to learn more. The bottom line for our course is that readability formulas don't account for everything that makes material plain. In fact, they don't even account for all the word and sentence level elements that do so. I'll have you do a little readability assessment of your own and reflect on its utility in some future assignments. There's a handout with relevant information in the instructional materials for Module 3. I'm not going to say anything about other writing tools in this lecture. Writing software is definitely uh, the one thing that is now probably the most common means of implementing both plain language and an organization's brand. There are natural language processing and artificial intelligence applications that have become much more widespread and affordable. Some of these are incredibly powerful tools. You may not know about them. I talk about some of them, or one of them at least, in TECM 5195, the technical editing course. Let me remind you that plain language was identified as a concern in the study of tech com pros and industry. Your growing expertise in this area will definitely benefit you.